Sabrina the Teenage Witch may just span a wider array of output than you would think, and today I would like to dig into it all. I grew up watching the live action TV show and the many years of reruns of it in the early 2000s on Nick at Night, giving the show a shot as I enjoyed Clarissa Explains It All. So it was fun to see what Melissa Joan Hart went on to next. At the same time, roughly, the animated series for Sabrina also started up. As the live action show was skewed slightly older for teen and young adult audiences, the cartoon would aim a bit younger and more open for all. From 1996 until 2003, both of these iterations of the character would expand the series in both mediums of live action and animation that really helped establish Sabrina as a bankable brand, one more so than the other, as in more modern times we have seen even further takes on the character. While the themes of witches have always had people captivated, the 90s truly saw a rise in media surrounding witches, from books to television to movies and more, with this carrying on further into the 2000s and even to current day to an extent, maybe not as much as the 90s or the early 2000s, but witches are still pretty popular. While Sabrina may not be the OG witch when it comes to all of media, for me, she basically was. So for the Halloween season, I felt like going back to it all. See how Sabrina came to be, how the film, show, and cartoon operated and performed, as well as what happened to this era for the real rise of Sabrina the Teenage Witch, and what came after. Time to cast a spell and enter on this magical journey. <laughs> The character of Sabrina the Teenage Witch comes from the Archie comics of the same name that started releasing in April of 1971, but the character of Sabrina Spellman actually debuted nearly a decade before that in October of 1962 in the Archie's Madhouse comic book magazine, saying hello to the reader and hoping she didn't disappoint you. Created by George Gladder and Dan DiCarlo, Sabrina would become a staple character and eventually jump out of the pages of her comics and into the realm of television. First, there was the original cartoon of the same name that came out in 1971, lasting for 61 episodes over two seasons that was directly ripped out of the pages of the comic, but today we are specifically exploring the 90s and 2000s era of Sabrina the Teenage Witch, but I figured I'd give this cartoon a mention as well since it was a part of the history of the character. Premiering April 7th, 1996 on Showtime, the Sabrina the Teenage Witch television movie brought us our first trip into the world of Sabrina, and a note to point out, this film is basically disconnected from the series that follows later on in 1996. Instead of being Sabrina Spellman, her last name is Sawyer, and the movie follows her going to live with her aunts out in Riverdale and eventually learning that she is a witch on her 16th birthday. From here, it becomes your standard rom-com filled with all the tropes that you can find there, just with an added touch of spells and magic for the fun of it. It boils down to Sabrina learning how to use her newfound powers as a witch to hopefully win over Seth and go to the dance with him, and yes, that is a young Ryan Reynolds. In doing so, she faces her biggest threat, Katie, the popular girl in school who ends up trying to expose Sabrina's witchy secrets to the masses. But maybe Seth isn't the one for Sabrina. Maybe this other dude, Harvey, is. So plot-wise, it's your typical teenage drama, which makes sense. We're dealing with a teenage witch whose problems stem from your average teenage issues. As an introduction to the live-action world for Sabrina, it serves its purpose in getting you familiar with her, her powers, her best friend, her aunts, and of course, her talking sassy cat, Salem, who is British here in the movie. Again, there are a lot of changes between the film and the upcoming series. Sabrina will be right back on ABC. The series premiere of Sabrina the Teenage Witch starts right now. Some of the changes aside from the last name involve the name of where Sabrina lives at with her aunts. Rather than it being in Riverdale to be a nod to the Archie comics, in the show it is changed to Westbridge. There are a bunch of other character changes, both small and large, but it's expected when essentially they are rebooting the premise to now be a sitcom rather than a drama. The film overall reviewed okay, but the interest in the character was still there, at least behind the scenes. The movie really serves as this pseudo-pilot to test the waters to bring Sabrina the Teenage Witch to a more expanded on TV show format. So a handful of months later, on September 27th, 1996, the sitcom version of Sabrina would premiere on ABC as a highly anticipated new series, raking in a massive 17 million plus viewers for the premiere episode. When the series itself starts up, it's a very similar start to the movie. Sabrina is living with her aunts Hilda and Zelda, it's her 16th birthday, and she finds out that she is a witch. Of course, Salem, the sassy talking cat is back, 
Jack, this time voiced by Nick Bakai, who you may recognize as Norbert from The Angry Beavers, and it's glorious. The series would follow Sabrina over seven total seasons in two other TV movies, with the first four seasons of the show being on ABC before the show would move over to the WB for three more seasons. I'll get into why that happened in a little bit, but clearly, the show was a massive hit. The viewership was high, and Melissa Joan Hart jumped from one popular series to another, giving her a strong vessel to ride into the 2000s. For the role of Sabrina, though, Melissa was 20 years old at the time and attending New York University, dropping out in order to fulfill her role in the movie at first. But how she got the role in the first place is interesting. Her mother Paula ended up seeing the character of Sabrina thanks to being handed the comic book of it, to which she believed it would be great for her daughter to play the role of her if it were to be turned into something live action. After this, she went right to Archie Comics and convinced them to sell her the rights to Sabrina for one dollar. You heard that right. One dollar. She had the foresight that this could be something big, getting Viacom to get behind making it into a movie and convince them during the production that this would also be great as a full-on television series. She would go on to make a proof-of-concept trailer of what the series could look like, bringing it to several networks where it immediately received offers to be turned into a full-on series, where it then landed on ABC. Sabrina in the show deals with the typical teenage drama that comes with being a teenager, of course, but here it gets to be played more for comedy thanks to the nature of a sitcom. Tell a joke or have something situationally comedic happen, brief pause for audience reaction, and boom, you get a weekly show about a witch that is relatable and satisfying, thanks to her being able to use spells to help her navigate the issues in her life at the time. At the house, you'll have both her aunts that end up serving as her parental figures and mentors that help her with both her teenage woes and her newly discovered magical powers that she needs to learn to be responsible with. And of course, Salem, who was turned into a talking cat as a punishment for trying to conquer the world as an evil dictator. Yeah, seriously. He's also the real comedian beat of the show, often dishing out the most laughs thanks to the snarky comments he makes all the time while being a cat. And to pull this character off, they played a bit of camera trickery, using a real cat or multiple real cats over the course of the series for further away shots to add realism with added voiceover, but for close-ups when we see Salem talking, he is an animatronic puppet that is controlled in various ways to move around a bit and speak while the voiceover would happen. While you can clearly tell it's a puppet as they really don't try to make you believe that the cat is really speaking, it works well in the Uncanny Valley to simulate that as much as possible. The character himself works well, and his presence in the show is greatly needed to provide a lot more fun for the series. Why am I invested in Salem on a date with another talking cat? I don't know, but the show had me into it. But what makes this show special is how it turned the concept of what you'd expect a show about witches and magic to be, and tries to do a bunch of new things that take this fantastical and horror-associated folklore-esque premise and turn it into something that can be considered sci-fi. It's not just the wish fulfillment of a teenager using her magical powers, it's a whole bunch of of, wait, why is there time travel? Now they have hologram technology and they could just visit other planets if they feel like it, being able to breathe there like they're just on a picnic at the park. It will still have the typical stuff associated with witches, like there's a spell book and powers, etc. But they didn't want to stop there and limit themselves to what could happen on any given episode. This firmly cemented the show in many ways, separate from what had come before from previous incarnations of Sabrina in the comics, cartoon, and even the movie that helped make the show happen in the first place, as well as just any media involving witches witches that had come before it or were also popular in the 90s. It's truly a testament to finding a way to stand out, and as long as it was funny or had somewhat of a point to it, then it could get away with any of the more out there ideas the show had at least in the beginning. The show would take the traditional storylines you'd see in almost any sitcom out there and infuse them with the fantastical, the mysterious, and the weird to broaden the excitement of something familiar. It introduces us to this other realm that fully consists of magic. It's where witches come from. It's where all the magical creatures out there come from, actually. It's presented as this, no pun intended, magical place that represents a different take on our realm on Earth. Mainly, we enter it through a portal in Sabrina's house that lets them go through it, but unlike what you might think, this realm is isn't blocked to mortals as regular humans could find their way into it whether on purpose or on accident. But this other realm isn't just magical and stuck in the typical world of fantasy like it would sound. It has laws, malls, a military, spas, and a place where soul stones are kept containing them for witches and humans alike as this plays into the plot way later on into the series itself. But with there being law, that means that there are rules to live by in this other realm that the Council of Witches oversee in order to, well, keep order. A lot of the rules are pretty silly, 
like giants having to wipe their feet before entering certain places, uh, children under 10 years of age have to be accompanied by a monkey, and no switching channels between the programs, so you better keep watching this video. And even no spitting. Okay, actually that one makes sense, that's just gross. The laws can also have a connecting factor over both the other realm and the realm of Earth and its inhabitants, giving us the explanation of how these two realms can connect and how more magical beings can be brought into the world or realms if, for example, a mortal and a witch get married and bear a child, with the child receiving their magical abilities of being a witch upon their 16th birthday, just like Sabrina did. But this is also something frowned upon, building lore about separating the magical beings and the plain Jane mortals. The laws go on to state how the use of magical powers to aid them in their everyday life in ways that interfere with life lessons, personal gain, charitable acts. But one of the most important things is trusting the secret of being a witch with a human and how if that human breaks that trust and tells others that a time limit of 12 hours is given to turn that person to stone or lose your magical abilities. Clearly, you can see how Sabrina throughout the series, being a teenager and all that, will have to deal with the consequences of breaking these rules sometimes. I think that, while the show at the end of the day is a sitcom, I appreciate the level of detail in creating such a lived-in world feeling, having all this lore built up and explained in parts throughout the series. There's just this level of thought that's built into this that I find very charming to see. On top of this, the characters, having several seasons to be fleshed out and grow, aren't one-dimensional caricatures of who they are defined to be. Sabrina starts off the series as just a 16-year-old girl who gets powers and deals with school, but we see her learn to be responsible with her powers, question the traditions and laws set by the higher-ups in the other realm, learn to trust, find love, and become an adult by the end of it all. Now, in saying that, beyond this or her relationships with her friends or love interests in the show, she isn't meant to be more than she is. There isn't too much to her character aside from her magical abilities that make her any different than the average teenage girl, but this is on purpose. She's meant to be the vessel of relatability for the audience, the character you attach yourself to as we go along the show. It stands out in comparison when we look at some of the other supporting cast and how they are more defined, but she's not meant to offer more than that. Some can view this as a negative spot to point out about the show, and I can see why, but I feel that she's just enough interesting on her own that she has her own personality and cool magical abilities, all while still being the latching onto point for the audience. Her aunts have base traits like Hilda being the more carefree and fun one, while Zelda is the more responsible and rule-following one. But they are more than that. Zelda isn't just the smart one who has to be mature, having her own moments of letting loose, trying to find love, and while being the voice of reason in many situations, never was just portrayed as a stickler, but rather someone who cares for her family. Hilda isn't just the less responsible aunt or figure for Sabrina to follow, she is musically talented, becomes an owner of a coffee shop, and is more complex than just being the younger sister to Zelda. As far as the rest of the supporting cast, they aren't shown in as much detail as the ones that surround Sabrina's home life. Her best friend Jenny leaves after one season, and now her best friend becomes Valerie for a couple seasons before she leaves as well, not serving much purpose to the stories told other than this generic best friend character, especially since they were that interchangeable and written off. Sabrina's main overall love interest, Harvey, is a character that doesn't have too much that defines him other than being a dude that Sabrina dates and eventually breaks up with her once he finds out she is a witch and leaves the series for a bit after season 4, when Sabrina was transitioning from high school to college, before he starts fully coming back in the final two seasons for his true love between Sabrina to hit its boiling point. The only supporting character in the school setting that truly feels like they have a lot more that defines them is the mean popular girl Libby, who is always at odds with Sabrina, but in a way that makes for some great situations to take place with some that really let us learn more about her character. But with that said, while she carries it well, she's one note as the mean girl. We just get to see more of how that defines her and then she's also eventually written out. The school Sabrina goes to itself offers little other than being a generic high school that leaves the show open to bring in the usual teenage drama with their social lives and interests or complications in their studies. But beyond this, there isn't too much interesting about that aspect. But the show was also filled with a ton of cameos as was the norm for many sitcoms, especially the really popular ones. And since the viewership here was averaging over 10 to 15 million viewers per episode, it wasn't hard to get many celebrities to appear on the show show, like Usher, Coolio, Britney Spears, Avril Lavigne, and both the Backstreet Boys and NSYNC. And that's just scratching the surface and only listing some musicians that appeared. The series even spawned video games, with a few of them on PC in 1999, as well as a PlayStation 1 game called A Twitch in Time in 2001, and a Game Boy Advance game published by Ubisoft in 2002 called Potion Commotion. To say this series was a hit would be an understatement, but ABC wasn't willing to come to a deal to keep the series going beyond Season 4. Let's dig into that. Coming up next, it's 
right, Salem the Cat. All right, Sabrina the Teenage Witch. The premiere of Sabrina the Teenage Witch, next. By the end of the fourth season of Sabrina the Teenage Witch, the ratings were still through the roof, but the budget for the show that included the cost of production and paying for the cast was now at an asking price at $1.5 million an episode for Viacom Productions, and ABC didn't want to front that bill. They'd rather cancel the show. But the WB would come in and save the show to continue it further, but did so at paying $675,000 per episode, less than half the asking cost. But the deal came to be that the show would at least last for another 66 episodes, so a promise of over $44 million for three more seasons of the show kept it going for a while longer. But by the time we were in season four of the show, the momentum that the show had seemed to be running low. When it came to ideas and concepts that involved Sabrina's school life and the concept of her just being a teenager, the show spent a lot of time focusing on outside factors to drive the plot, like her aunts or Sabrina working a job, essentially anything that could push the plot away from the standard school affair that a teenager would be dealing with. Whether it be the lack of ideas of what to do in this regard or just not being interested in exploring things further with this aspect. Something that became extremely noticeable as the show went on was the way that the show would deal with Sabrina having to navigate around the mortals knowing the truth about her or what they experienced thanks to places like ending up in the other realm. With the show usually wrapping things up with a memory erasing deus ex machina to clean up any messy situation that gets out of hand. It can be funny at some points when this happens, but as the series would go on, it became a bit tiring and a crutch for the show to get away with building up something that wouldn't be so easy to get out of or continue on from. The show would introduce other characters in Sabrina's life that would know about her witch powers, but they would also be somewhat entangled in the magical world themselves, either being witches or even a witch hunter, but these would only be small moments or briefly used characters that didn't get explored further. Then, like I mentioned, the college era of the show would happen as we get to the back three seasons on the WB. To give the show new life, Sabrina is a young adult now and moving out of her aunt's home for college, getting new side characters in her life like her roommates. Roxy, an activist who often can clash with Sabrina, Morgan, who is very into herself and her fashion designs, as well as the men in Sabrina's life, and lastly Miles, who is just a dude who is really into the supernatural and extraterrestrial. Along with these newer, more focused on characters is Josh, who serves as a love interest for a bit, but the problem with this direction for the show is the same as I just explained, navigating around these characters without them finding out her secrets. On top of that, the aunts have been pushed to the side when they were such an important part of the magical side of things. In fact, the show went towards a more mature tone slightly. Switching networks obviously opened up the door to change things up a bit, but the show seemed to try and grow up with where the character of Sabrina is as an adult now. While Melissa at the time in real life was dealing with her own set of personal stuff going on, it seemed as if she wanted the show to appeal to older audiences who were watching programs or other sitcoms that aimed slightly older than the demographic the show was usually hitting for teenagers. Whatever the case may be, the show definitely began to change. The focus on teenage problems were seemingly gone, college wasn't too big of a focus, and a lot of the situations in the show were brought on through her relationships with her roommates, her love life, and her job pursuits. All of which can be fine in their own right, but it was riding off the back of what was built before it. It was a teenager dealing with teenage problems. And sure, you're technically still a teenager throughout your first bit of college, but the teenage struggle became the adult struggle. Things could still be relatable, sure, but it started pushing aside the things that made the show charming. It felt like the original concept was fighting against a new concept that would turn the show into something it never was. It wanted to establish a new cast of friends for Sabrina to give a feeling of one of the most popular shows on the air. Friends. It just couldn't find that line to tow as it really felt like a transition they couldn't complete. What's left is a mess of ideas, new characters, and plot points that never fully get fleshed out into something. By the end of it all, in season 7, the show takes a lot of jumps to where we are at now. Her aunts are basically taken out of the show as they have moved to the other realm, and she now works as a reporter for a magazine called Scorch. She also ends up moving back into her aunt's place as they are no longer there. But Salem is still around as he has this back and forth relationship with Harvey now, as he wants to get Sabrina back, but she has a fiance now named Aaron for some reason. On the WB, these final three seasons of the show didn't end up bringing in the same 
viewership like it used to have, now averaging around 2 to 4 million viewers an episode, compared to 10 million and more. While the show did end up having a put-together conclusion to wrap up the story, the series would go out as more of a lit match rather than the raging flame it used to be. Going back to the show itself really made me appreciate what made it special in the first place, and that's all the things that really worked in the first 3 to 4 seasons. And that's not to say that there weren't some highlights of seasons 5 through 7, but the magic that cast a spell on what made Sabrina the Teenage Witch such a good concept in the first place was sadly no longer working, and the series from there was over. Now, there were two other TV movies that came out during the run of the show, 1998's Sabrina Goes to Rome and 1999's Sabrina Down Under, both made during the first era of the show before transferring to the WB. The first film, Sabrina Goes to Rome, follows Sabrina and Salem as they head to Rome, as she got a letter from her father regarding a mysterious locket that she needs to open to help set free a special power to save her other aunt, Sophie. On top of that, she only has two weeks to do this or her aunt will be gone forever, but first she needs to figure out how to open it with the clue of the secret to the locket being in Rome. We get to meet another witch that joins on this journey with her named Gwen, and she even has a talking pet of her own, a guinea pig named Stony. Sabrina also ends up meeting Paul, who witnesses her magical abilities and wants to sell the story, but thanks to Sabrina helping him out, he doesn't expose her secret for a quick buck, and trusting her heart was the only way to save her aunt Sophie. It's not an incredible film, it's more so like an extended special episode of the series that still ended up pulling in nearly 13 million viewers, so it was a success. The show was doing great, the film did great, so of course ABC was down for another film, with the following movie coming the next year, Sabrina Down Under. Here it has Sabrina meeting up with Gwen once more as she goes on vacation to the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, and a whole lot happens here. One, Salem is back on this adventure as he finds a love interest in another imprisoned person turned into a cat that doesn't end well when her sentence as a cat runs out and turns back into a woman. And two, mermaids. Yep, mermaids. I mean, yeah, it makes sense. This feels more so on the believable side of things for the show, honestly. But Sabrina ends up having to help the mermaids and one specific hunk of a merman from the waters being polluted and a marine biologist hell-bent on finding and exposing the existence of mermaids to the world to garner fame. And helping out, though, she ends up getting hit by lightning, leading to her losing her magical abilities for a bit. And I think I like this film a bit more than the last due to the sheer ridiculousness of it all. And the setting is one I just really like. It still did great viewership-wise, having over 10 million viewers tune in. There wasn't another film, obviously, as at this point, we were going into season four, and the whole switch from the networks was about to happen. But this video isn't only about the live-action stuff. As I said, there is a whole other side of Sabrina to look at as well that came out around the same time. Sabrina, the animated series. Melissa Joan Hart is now casting her spell in Sabrina the Teenage Witch. But at least I don't talk to walls like Clarissa did. Cool. Sabrina the Animated Series is a different take on the character of Sabrina in a few ways. One, she is not a 16-year-old who discovers her powers, but rather a 12-year-old in middle school who is living with her aunts and knows about magic and borrows magical powers, as her doing so causes a bunch of cartoony problems to have her go and fix. Here, her friend Chloe knows about this and holds on to that secret for her, and since the character was younger, they needed a younger voice to fit the role of Sabrina, and funny enough, it was kept in the family, as Melissa's younger sister Emily Hart came in to voice Sabrina. The series would play on both UPN's Disney's 1-2 block and ABC's Disney's 1 Saturday morning block starting on September 6th, 1999. The whole series consists of 65 episodes, the typical Disney-related allotment, but all of them came out so fast. Basically, every day an episode would come out, with the series concluding its run just two and a half months later on November 19th, 1999. Talk about a short-lived show in regards to how long it ran, but 65 episodes is still a whole lot. The reruns would still play play on those programming blocks until 2002, or then it would instead play reruns on the Disney Channel and Toon Disney. Nick would be back to voice Salem, which was nice and added a lot of fun to the cartoon, and while he's still as sassy as ever, other characters like the aunts are adapted to be much less like they are in the show, and are brought down to their base traits of Hilda being a free spirit and not always playing by the rules, while Zelda is more by the books and overprotective. In the cartoon, they are also magically aged down to their teenage selves, thanks to Queen Enchantra. The top witch in charge of the witches' council in the other realm. This was a punishment dished out to them for their misuse of magic, and now they really don't have that parental and mentor-like figure status as much, having more moments of them bickering as sisters. For Sabrina to use magic in the series, she has access to Spooky Jar, a genie that resides inside of a regular-looking cookie jar, but much like how a genie operates, the granting of the magic needed for whatever Sabrina needs usually turns into a giant mess that she needs to clean up and learn a life lesson from. The show puts a larger emphasis on Sabrina's social 
social life with her being younger and her friend Chloe being involved. The plots and situations we find Sabrina in are a bit more juvenile in comparison to the sitcom as well due to the demographic the cartoon was aiming for, so it still has that relatable factor just for a younger audience. Melissa did have a role to play in the cartoon as well though, voicing both Hilda and Zelda, so that's pretty neat. I do think it's nice that the cartoon takes its own route for the story and characters for the most part. Having Chloe be in the know of Sabrina's magical abilities adds a layer of character building and bonding that the sitcom struggled to deal with. The cartoon also brings in variations of what we've seen in the sitcom. Sabrina goes to school, deals with a mean popular girl, and even Harvey is there. Even though the show does bring its own set of ideas to the table and plots for episodes, it also borrowed and recycled episodes of the sitcom, finding a way to make them work for a younger Sabrina. It still brings in some of the sci-fi elements that the sitcom had, so it didn't feel held to only focus on traditional witch-related tropes, and a lot of this transitioned well to the cartoon medium, allowing the ridiculous moments to be more expressive and exciting in a way only a cartoon can emphasize. Overall, the animated series is pretty funny. There's a lot of fun and clever writing throughout, and what it understood the most is what made the sitcom so great in the first place, and what it started losing when we got to season four and beyond, and that is getting the character of Sabrina, her personality, her wants, her way of learning lessons correct. The show seems to know what to keep a focus on, bringing the best aspects of the show and adding on a more interesting layer with the surrounding characters in her life, like her friends, as well as how she navigates her school life. It felt like the cartoon was able to deliver on what the sitcom couldn't in some aspects, which makes it stand out apart from the sitcom in a fresh way that doesn't feel like we are taking in the same experience, just in animated form, even if some plots are reused. It had fun with the property, it was able to be more goofy than the sitcom, and it was just a cool new way to enjoy enjoy Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Neither the sitcom or the cartoon were affected negatively by the existence of the other. In fact, I only see it as a benefit that both were able to capture a level of magic that made them each special. The animated series was doing well enough for its time on the air that it had its own merch, like dolls associated with it, but also video games too, like a PC game in 2000 and two Game Boy Color games, Zapped in 2000 and Spooked in 2001, both made by Way Forward. It almost had a spin-off series all about Salem that was far enough in development that they had 52 episodes planned, a budget for each episode, and wanted to have it ready for the fall of 2001. It would have followed Salem on his quest to do good in order to no longer be imprisoned as a cat, but this never saw the light of day and was scrapped, but there was more for the animated series yet to come. As the reruns were happening, Deke Entertainment was coming in to produce more for the animated series, creating the movie Sabrina Friends Forever that follows a now 13-year-old Sabrina who gets a magic wand, attends a witch academy, and makes friends with Nicole a half-witch just like herself, as they start a journey to the witch's realm to hopefully become full witches like the rest of the students at the academy. It premiered on Nickelodeon on October 6, 2002, so Sabrina, in animated form, was now technically on both the Disney Channel and on Nickelodeon. Weird, huh? Beyond this, the series wasn't done just yet. Thanks to the popularity of the live-action Sabrina still around in 2002, there was still promise in trying to continue the animated series. With Deke co-producing the series further with a French studio, the sequel series titled Sabrina's Secret Life started coming out in France and syndicated to the US with the same voice cast from the movie on November 10th, 2003, lasting for one season with 26 episodes. This series followed Sabrina at 14 years old now and also in high school, where just in Sabrina fashion, ends up with a new best friend since Chloe is written off and she now continues her use of magic from the wand she received. After this, the Sabrina brand had run its course. The live action sitcom had come to an end, the animated series had come to an end, and this era for Sabrina was over, for now. It was a massive hit for the back half of the 90s and start of the 2000s, and lives on as a pop cultural impact for entertainment at the time. Whether you watched the sitcom or the cartoon, if you were around at the time, you got to be a part of the rise in popularity of witches in entertainment that was given a huge spotlight through the property of Sabrina. I think a lot of what the sitcom offers still holds up today and is well written, it's witty, it's funny, and it had charm. The cartoon for the most part captures a more playful innocence of the character character and offers a lot of fun adventures, specifically speaking about the 1999 run of the animated series. The brand was huge, the concept was creative, and it helped give new 
true life to the comic book character that most people can recognize when they see or hear the name. While the property may have gotten a bit too ridiculous by the time it was coming to an end, all you needed to sell someone for interest in the series was the simple yet understandable concept that it was, Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Beyond this, there would still be plenty of more Sabrina to come, eventually. For the character in the comics, Sabrina was still around, trying to incorporate parts of the sitcom in the comics while that was on, having a comic series that followed the animated show, and plenty more for all of the years following, even having newer iterations of the comics semi-recently. But as far as television goes, 2013 would see the next iteration of an animated show called Sabrina, Secrets of a Teenage Witch. 2018 would see the next version of a live-action show, this time being a horror drama thriller for slightly older audiences called The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, based on the comic series of the same name that started four years before that. And the most recent thing was having the same Sabrina from that show cross over into the show Riverdale, coming full circle with the main Archie gang. I may not be able to speak on the quality of all that, but the character of Sabrina lives on, and I'm sure we'll see plenty more incarnations of the character down the road. But as far as the takeover that Sabrina the Teenage Witch had in the late 90s and early 2000s, that's all there was. It was a cool moment to live through and then re-experience while making this video. If you have any personal memories or thoughts to share regarding the sitcom or cartoon, heck, anything regarding Sabrina the Teenage Witch in general, let me know in the comments. I've been Jordan Fringe, thanks so much for watching, like and subscribe, later.